Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where, fittingly, Apple's 200 million Argyle and 3500 Vision Pro dropped the very same weekend. Two overly expensive endeavors that seem ridiculous and slated for failure. But maybe we should let Apple cook. Let's discuss! Now, some of you might be saying you're, that I'm letting Argyle off the hook. How could this be anything but a colossal failure and embarrassment? But, you know, Apple's playing the long game, and we're going to discuss that. But it's likely game over, for sure, for a number of the Hollywood talent associated with this clear box office dud. It's very bad for some people. Perhaps most indicative of this mess, this was delicious, I, I couldn't believe this happened, is that on Friday, one of the Hollywood trades said that Argyle, they described Argyle as an all-star cast. Yet as they listed that cast, they failed to mention the film's two leads, Sam Rockwell and Bryce Dallas Howard. And they have yet to correct it. I thought for sure that would get corrected. Where are Rockwell and uh, Howard's agents or PR people? Although maybe they, I mean, of course they're associated with this. Maybe they're like, hey, it's better if their name, their names don't come up. But how could they not? Rockwell has an Oscar, and Bryce Dallas Howard is not only Ron Howard's daughter, sure, Nepo baby, but a respectable Nepo baby. She has starred in the Jurassic World trilogy, where each ma movie made a billion dollars. You might not be able to explain it, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. I liked the movies, but I know a lot of you did not. And also, she's directed several Disney Plus Star Wars episodes at this point. So, put a little respect on their names. But while I do respect both of them, I think that sadly neither one will ever top line a major film again. I mean, them's just the facts, man. I mean, Rockwell, he's, he'll be fine. He'll take his Oscar and go back to the kind of movies he was making before, small indies, and maybe Marvel's Armor Wars. Although the lack of excitement about his return in What If maybe makes me feel that won't happen either. Uh, I like Sam Rockwell, but apparently it's a small group. And maybe Bryce Dallas Howard, this was so bad that I, and she doesn't have an Oscar. So I think that maybe she might want to do a little bit more directing. That might be the best next step for her. I mean, I think they're both excellent in this movie, particularly Rockwell. But Argyle is such a box office dud with viewers rejecting uh, Rockwell and Howard so resolutely. You know, it's, it's so mean because they're like, they're not Henry Cavill and Dua Lipa. You know, it's just, it's such a rejection that as a film producer or studio executive, I'd just be too nervous to roll the dice on them again. Interestingly, that's the logo for Matthew Vaughn's production company. And let's talk about Matthew Vaughn. Oh, he likes to dish it out. Can he take it? So he's been telling everyone that Argyle didn't cost $200 million to make, but that's what he got Apple to pay for it. I don't know why Apple paid so much up front for a movie that they... Well, I guess they're doing it with Universal, but that would play in theaters. I'd be like, you want your back end? Take it out of the theatrical. But they paid $200 million for it, and I don't think that's quite the win that Matthew Vaughn is presenting it as. Because apparently, here's the deal. Vaughn likes to finance his own movies and then get the studios to pick them up after the fact so he doesn't have any studio interference. Now, some of you might be like, yeah, get those studios out of here, but look at the results. And I think that considering the box office failure of the Kingsman and now Argyle, it'll be a very long time, if, if ever, he can get a studio to write him another big check. And you know what? Maybe some studio interference wouldn't be such a bad thing. Or at least a producer who can say no to him. Like, wow, talk about being in your own bubble. But I just think that bubble got burst. Uh, although the question is, there are a lot of people in Hollywood who you can burst their bubble and they still think they're floating. Uh, I really enjoyed Argyle, by the way, but when I put my business hat on, uh, I mean, like, from a fan perspective, I thought the film was a hoot. But from a business perspective, I could tell that most people would not like it. I said that in my review, and I was right. In fact, look at these audience scores. That's a yikes and an ouch. Whew. And I'm not at all surprised. You know, when I watched it, I was like, I like it, but I don't see any money here. Uh, furthermore, this makes it absolutely ridiculous that Vaughn has been going around critiquing Hollywood all this past week, from the casting of Supergirl to his predictions for the MCU. 
Just because a journalist asks you a question does not mean you have to answer it. That's what your PR people in the room are for. Especially a question that has nothing to do with the movie that you're promoting. And also, it should have been very telling to Vaughn that no journalists felt that articles about his actual movie would get any clicks, so they were asking about him about other franchises that are more clickbaity. That's hilarious, and I think a sign again of what happened. But as for Apple, industry insiders are snarking that Apple keeps producing 200 million underperformers. I saw a couple of quotes in the trades today that they were like, we know how to control our talent. And it's like, do you? Do you know how to control your talent? But anyway, you know, they're like, woohoo, look at Apple, look at this. Yet others are countering that Apple has so much money that 200 million or even 600 million is really nothing to them. And I think that there's a lot of truth in that as well. They've certainly managed to buy their way into the Hollywood conversation, and while their box office returns are pretty bad, they're, they did pretty good with the Oscar nominations. Uh, this year, we'll see how they do with wins, and they are still the first streamer to win Best Picture back in 2022. Nothing can take that away from them, ever, although that movie did not cost $200 million to make. So there's a little bit of a lesson there. But these movies are, to some degree, huge advertisements for not just Apple TV+, Plus but Apple itself is a company. Uh, both Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon, despite, you know, well, Killers of the Flower Moon had good audience scores, but you know what? No matter what, they did very well, both of them on digital, you know, before even getting to Apple TV, where they end up eventually. Napoleon is still in the digital phase and still in the top 10, where it's been for weeks. And Killers of the Flower Moon has moved to Apple TV+, Plus, where it's the number one movie on the streaming service. Uh, likewise, it, let's point out that Netflix who's also been laughed at quite a bit, that they are still producing ridiculously expensive movies. So there must be some method to this madness. Uh, two winners, though, here are Henry Cavill and Dua Lipa, who apparently are the duo that fans wanted to see. Uh, and Universal's misleading ad campaign did not work. You know, I can see saying, well, you know, Henry Cavill didn't get anybody into the multiplex because he was used to promote the film. But I think that word spread like wildfire prior to the movie's release that it was a bait and switch. So I don't think that you can hold Henry Cavill responsible. Uh, I don't know how well a Henry Cavill movie would do. We still don't really, but we'll find out soon. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I would say that Universal advertised Argyle as a male-friendly sexy spy movie when it's really aimed, I think, largely at female audiences. And the result was an audience that did not match the movie, skewing slightly male and older, and as you can see, they did not care for the movie. Uh, with all due respect to Bryce Dallas Howard, who again, I like quite a bit, Vaughn would have been much smarter to cast a female lead who would signal and attract the correct audience for this film. Someone like Sandra Bullock, Reese Witherspoon, Kate Winslet I think could have been interesting, or Amy Adams, Tina Fey would have been a hilarious choice for what was apparently Vaughn's pitch that J.K. Rowling discovered her fantasy books were real. Uh, in my review of Argyle, I also said that either Vaughn would be rewarded for his outside-the-box casting choices or find out why Hollywood operates the way that it does. And it turned out to be the latter. He got a little bit of a lesson in casting. Uh, quite the lesson, actually. I'm sure it smarts. Although, again, Matthew Vaughn might be the type of person who just doesn't pay attention. Speaking of hot Hollywood stars, Universal used Cavill, as I said, like crazy to promote Argyle, which is nice for Cavill, but pretty gutsy for Universal, considering he only appears in about 15 minutes of a two-plus-hour movie. But he got a lot of publicity out of it, and he does have two movies coming up where he is very much a part of the film and stars, and they're both Guy Ritchie movies, interestingly enough. Who knows when Chad Stahelski will get Highlander off the ground, that Highlander uh, reboot. But... Two Guy Ritchie movies? That means Cavill has gone from being the new Superman to the new Jason Statham. But you know what? Being Jason Statham ain't so bad. Uh, they're both British, by the way, which I think is interesting. Uh, and Statham did, did particularly well this weekend. And his uh, male-friendly actioner, which is actually a male-friendly actioner, might have eaten into Argyle's debut. Uh, I think that's very possible. Because while Mean Girls finally had a big drop, you know, a substantial drop, the beekeeper is still holding steady, despite having just hit digital. You can watch this at home now, and people are still going to the multiplex to see it. So cheer up, Matthew Vaughn. If David Ayer can, uh, you know, crawl, crawl back and make a comeback, anyone can. But wow, look at number two, The Chosen. 
That's that fan favorite religious series that we've talked about before because this, is, this isn't their first foray into the multiplex. It's their third. And each time they've gotten higher up in the top 10 with their debut. But this time, they're sticking around because instead of just debuting the latest season in theaters, well, they started out with a special, then the debut of season three, but now all of season four will play in theaters. They're gonna release it two to three episodes at a time, two weeks apart for the entire month. And I'm very curious to see how it performs. This is another experiment as theaters and uh, you know uh, companies outside of like the, you know, the, the core of Hollywood experiment because we're post strike and also streaming has become just such a big and strong competitor. So theaters are happy, happier than ever to think outside the box and open their theaters to others who will, who will think outside the box. Of course, there's been Taylor Swift, but I think the group that has benefited the most from this is the religious conservative marketplace. I'm very curious to see how Ordinary Angels performs at the end of this month. This is being distributed by Lionsgate, and it co-stars Reacher's Alan Richson. And it has very little competition. I think it could do really, really well. And again, I think you're going to see more of Hollywood's core get into this market because it does so well. Uh, and that weekend is going to be very interesting because another big movie that's opening represents another genre or genres that have done very well as theaters look for uh, other sources of revenue. That is a Japanese film, an anime, uh, a, the latest Demon Slayer movie. And I think those two films are going to really vie for first place unless somehow Madam Web is a huge hit and remains at number one. But that's going to be a very interesting uh, weekend to watch. As to the rest of this weekend's top 10, uh, are you planning to see any of those movies? I'm curious. Uh, in theaters. All right, as for the rest of this weekend's top 10, Wonka and Migration both held up incredibly well, 16 freaking percent. And they're both on digital right now, so that makes that even more incredible. And they're doing very well on digital. Wonka, though, is now past 200 million domestic and getting close to 600 million worldwide. That's incredible. I hope they are just waiting for Dune to come out before they announce uh, a Wonka 2. Where is the sequel announcement? Uh, again, I just hope it's all about like negotiating for higher salary for Timmy Chalamet. We'll see what happens, but how do we not have a, se a, a, a sequel announcement for Wonka with those numbers? Uh, anyone but you can, oh, this is fascinating. So anyone but you continues to chug along and will likely, I think not only hit 80 million, but might get a scooch past it because uh, for Valentine's Day, as some of you pointed out, uh, they are releasing it again with a little bit of extra bonus footage this Friday, starting this Friday. Uh, I actually saw it this weekend, by the way. That's right, I caved. I wanted to go to the movies, so I saw anyone but you. And it's exactly what you would expect. I candy the movie. Salty and sweet as an edgy rom-com. It's very edgy, surprisingly edgy, but it works. But you know what I love about this? You might recall that Kate Hudson a couple of weeks ago was talking about how today's male stars are very reluctant to do romantic comedies. Yet here, it's a romantic comedy that finally leveled up Glenn Powell's career. If I was the agent or manager or I was pitching a rom-com and some male star of today said he thought it was lame, I'd say, well, just ask Glenn Powell and all the movies that he's now suddenly getting because he made so much money at the box office in a romantic comedy. All right, so Oscar contenders, American Fiction and Poor Things are also still chugging along and they're not able to get out of the bottom of the top 10, but that's okay. The Academy loves movies that don't do particularly well at the box office. Uh, and American Fiction hits digital on Tuesday and surely Poor Things' digital debut is, is not far behind. Uh, because once, once they start, once they did the expansion and you know, the Oscars are so far out, they just can't wait for the Oscars to go digital. So I think that's gonna come up soon. All right, now let's head over ourselves to streaming, where wow, another wow, look at Fool Me Once's numbers. Those are incredible. We haven't seen a debut this big in a while, proving that nobody can glow up content like, net, like Netflix. And not just any content, often content that you would never think would be the bell of the ball. Like, wow, who watched that? Somebody, some of you must have, because those numbers are crazy. I've looked at the trailer several times, and I just can't bring myself to do it, but it's a huge hit. Uh, this, by the way, is the chart for the week after New Year's, where people still have a lot of downtime. And Reacher, for instance, also continues to do very well. You know, people are up and ready to watch stuff, and it's fascinating to see what they watch. So, really interesting observations here. I, I, I can't wait to share these with you. So Reacher, by the way, isn't a binge show, but is instead something that airs weekly, and it continues to do very well mid-run here. This is mid-run. 
Uh, back to Netflix, though, they glowed up two other movies this week as well. Sony's Equalizer 3 and 2018's Aquaman on loan from Warner Brothers. Oh, just wait until we get to the movies chart. This is fantastic. Uh, Zazzy must be like hoping this is the start of a beautiful 2024 for him. And it might be. But most of this list, the overall list, older show, like older acquired shows. Like people are going back and watching older content. Uh, Suits even got back up in here. But where's Percy Jackson? We thought that after two really strong weeks on the OG chart and raising up the originals chart uh, here on Nielsen, that it would have broken through into the overall chart this week. But you know what happened instead? It went down on the originals chart. My goodness. This week it's number six, whereas last week it was number three. What the heck's happening to the show? I know some people have been complaining about it, and so maybe that did materialize in the viewership. Oh, this is fascinating. Some of you were surprised it didn't get an immediate season two renewal when season one just wrapped, like last week. And I was like, they must just be waiting for something because it did so well. But now I'm like, whoa, let's wait. I mean, it did trend on Twitter every night that it dropped, you know, every Tuesday, but this is a disturbing and surprising development. So let's see what happens as it finishes out its uh, run on the Nielsen charts. Remember, Nielsen is a month behind, but Disney gets those numbers faster. So I wonder what their decision will ultimately be. Uh, is, Dis- is Percy Jackson an expensive show to make? I mean, it seems kind of expensive, but I don't think it's like super expensive, I would think. Uh, Netflix is The Crown is still doing very well with its final season, and The Brother's Son had an okay debut here, while Dave Chappelle broke through on the Nielsen charts with his special. Usually we only see the stand-ups on Netflix's own charts, but here it's on, he's on Nielsen, and that is a rare feat indeed. Then here's the movies chart. Look at how well this Warner Brothers Netflix deal is working out. Four of those movies are in the top ten here, which they're still available on Max, as you can see, but obviously, obviously it's Netflix that got them to chart. Whew! Uh, It's crazy. Why are you watching these movies on Netflix instead of Max where they've already been available? That's really interesting. Also, more on that in a moment. Also, Netflix's Spanish language, Society of the Snow, is number four. We rarely see non-English language movies on this chart. I mean, sure, Netflix offers high-quality dubs, so you could have watched this movie in English, actually, but they do that for all their content. Even the English content is available in very quality dubs for other countries. So here on the U.S. charts, though, it is a major accomplishment that this film was able to not only break through to the chart, but place so high. That's fantastic. I love that for that movie. This list is all Netflix movies, by the way, and only one of them, Society of the Snow, is a Netflix original. Everything else is from other studios, suggesting that Netflix might be the least churned of the streaming services. And when people are looking for something to watch, particularly when there's a lot of downtime right after New Year's, Their first stop is Netflix. Which streaming services do you churn? And are there any that you do not? Uh, And what's your first stop when you're looking for something to watch? On Netflix's own charts, Kevin Hart's Lift is still number one for the third week in a row. But what the heck is Mind Cage with Martin Lawrence, uh, John Malkovich, and whoever the heck that lady is? This is a 2022 movie from Lionsgate that went straight to digital, but that nobody even paid attention to or knew existed until now. How do you do it, Netflix? How do you do it? They made Mind Cage work. Uh, Also, Sony's Dumb Money finally hit Netflix. Remember, Sony doesn't have their own streaming service, so their movies end up here. Uh, But this one, people weren't interested in it, even on Netflix. With shows, Griselda had a very, I would say, solid to strong debut. I mean, this isn't fool me once, but this is very solid. This is strong. And I'll be interested to see what producer and star Sofia Vergara does with this, you know, Solid win. Uh, I mean, she didn't spike the ball or anything, but it's good. It's good. I mean, it's commendable that she could have just lived off her modern family syndication money and endorsement deals for the rest of her life, yet here she is transitioning to a dramatic actress. Overall Netflix deal incoming? I'd be tempted to give her a deal, at least for, I'd be like, do you have any other series you want to do? Because I think think there might be something here. What do you think? I think she's excellent on the show. Uh, American Nightmare and Fool Me Once, in its fourth week here on this chart, are also both still doing well. Well, sure enough, as I anticipated last week, Griselda came along and knocked the wind out of Michelle Yeoh's own crime series. Why were they released so close together? Then on iTunes, Wonka is the latest theatrical release to dominate on digital. I'm so happy for Wonka. I bought it, even though I've already seen it twice. I love that movie. With many movies impressively staying in this top 10 for a very long time. Plus Wonka, Beekeeper, Aquaman, and Migration 
are all still in theaters as we speak and doing solid business. It's interesting to see The Holdovers back in the top 10 as well. Not only does it have uh, multiple Oscar nominations, but it's ju now just a $6 rental. Uh, as for this coming weekend, uh, it's the Super Bowl, a week from today, the big game, Usher's halftime show, Taylor Swift drama, commercials, and of course, movie trailers, which I will be covering. And I have a surprise in store for you. I'm very excited. We're going to have a great time. By the way, speaking of major events that feature Taylor Swift, the Grammys are tonight on CBS. And while she isn't performing and Travis Kelsey won't be there, he's got a Super Bowl to prepare for. Uh, I think this has gotten to such a crazy level. There's not only the conspiracy theories, but the Embassy of Japan even released a letter saying that, don't worry, Taylor Swift will be able to make the Super Bowl, even though she has a show in Japan, you know, technically the day before. Thank goodness for time zone differences. Uh, but anyway, her fans, not only is she up for six awards, but her fans are convinced that she's going to announce her next uh, Taylor's version re-release tonight. You got to admire Taylor Swift. I mean, nobody, nobody can move the needle like her right now. Uh, I mean, no matter what you think of her, you got to give her the props for that. Only Focus Features dares to counter-program the Super Bowl next weekend with Lisa Frankenstein getting a head start on Valentine's Day box office. Some movies do open for Valentine's Day the week after, uh, but this is trying to get out ahead of them and again to counter-program the Super Bowl. Uh, and Valentine's Day, by the way, is on a Wednesday this year. I'll, I'm, I mean, I'm going to review Lisa Frankenstein, but that looks like something you'd watch on digital to me. Uh, I'm surprised it's gotten a theatrical release, but maybe I'll be really shocked when I see the movie and be like, it is worth seeing in theaters. We'll see. As for digital, again, American Fiction hits Tuesday, while with streaming movies on Friday, we've got two. There's Prime Video's rom-com girl power movie, Upgraded, where Marissa Tomei, it's basically kind of like a Prime Video version of The Devil Wears Prada, but like for an art gallery, and Marissa Tomei is in the Meryl Streep role. That's crazy to me. Although I think some people might watch that. It looked okay. Uh, I watched the trailer before doing uh, movie math. And Hulu's tearjerker, Suncoast, also has substantial star power, although it looks very sad to me. Uh, finally, with shows, Curb Your Enthusiasm is back for its final season starting tonight, with Larry David getting the best slash worst PR of all time with his Elmo stunt on Friday. I shared my thoughts on Twitter over the weekend about this. When you see, if you just hear about it, it's very different than actually seeing the footage of the attack. And just to reiterate, I think it's amazing what it did for Larry David. If it doesn't blow up in his face, we'll see. What are your feelings about this, uh, this skirmish? But I do feel really bad for Elmo and the Sesame Street team because I don't think Elmo was in on the joke. If you're going to do a joke like this, especially if it involves putting your hands on someone, and there is a puppeteer involved, thank you very much, you know, you really have to, I think, uh, coordinate with them. Then I would have been, if Elmo had been in on this, I would have been, uh, I would have been all in. I would, I would have thought it was fantastic. But then also I thought it really unfortunately shut down the important conversation that Elmo had introduced about mental health and compassion for others that had trended on Twitter and the president had even commented on it and he was on the Today Show with his dad talking about it. And then everyone just talked about how uh, Larry David did the iron claw on his face. So uh, it was unfortunate, but it might really help Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm premiere. I think it was a step too far. If Elmo, again, if Elmo had just been in on the joke, I think it would have been a lot better. Uh, Abbott Elementary finally returns on Wednesday. Abbott Elementary, such a hot show. We don't usually talk about network TV, but Abbott Elementary totally is worth it. Uh, while on Thursday, Halo Season 2 kicks off on Paramount+, Plus. Tokyo Vice Season 2 kicks off on Max, I can't believe that show came back, and Netflix drops their series remake of One Day. Speaking of Anne Hathaway movies, everyone's remaking Anne Hathaway content today. We've got a Devil Wears Prada version, and then, of course, she did a movie of One Day. Uh, and th so that's this week's movie math. A little low on content, but I think uh, that's because the Super Bowl is coming up. Uh, what have you been watching on Valentine's Day? So what have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of Apple's Argyle Gamble? Who lost? How much did they lose by? And do you think anyone won? What do you think of Apple's $200 million gambles? Or, and are they even gambles or just giant advertisements? Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.